here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna actually start with um, sharing my screen. We'll talk about autism, we'll come back. You do your, uh, I'm gonna make you a host and um, then you do it. And we'll talk about these things that you see in the community and how we can help. And I am hoping people will trickle in. It's Ramadan and I understand it's, <laughs> it's a little hard, uh, you know, especially on a weekend, but inshallah. So uh, people who are um, on there, let me introduce myself. I'm Afshan Khan, I'm a child psychiatrist in town. Uh, we have the pleasure of having Noreen Emma there. Noreen's kind of the founder of Champ. Um, uh, a volunteer. I was okay, volunteer. Okay, but but I mean, I I really appreciate the fact that there is somebody in our community trying to give resources and uh, help people navigate. So uh, Noreen's going to talk about Champ in a while, and I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about autism and just what I see, and I'm going to sway away from going into controversial things and uh, keeping it really basic and simple because I truly believe sometimes the parents are in expertise because people who kind of do the research know so much more because uh, than what I do because autism is one of the many things that I do. Uh, I do not call myself an expertise on it. So um, I think it is important uh, that I'm coming from a perspective of being pretty simple and just understanding uh, the basics. So let me share my... Uh, Can you guys see this? Yes. I'm gonna try to. Okay, so we're really gonna talk about understanding autism and its community resources. Okay, well, we're just gonna understand what autism really means. It's really a neurodevelopmental disorder where there's difference between social interaction, verbal, nonverbal communication, and a lot of repetitive behaviors. Causes, it's hard to say. There's no link to vaccination support and research. Um, so I know a lot of people kind of uh, heavily way on it. Um, some people believe that maybe MMR or the supportive uh, material that's used to support the vaccine may be because um, people have delayed vaccine, people have not taken vaccine. I feel like the risk versus benefit in terms of what if you didn't take vaccine, uh, the amount of diseases that not only are you not, you might get it, but you're spreading and um, long-term side effects of those is harder. Delayed vaccine may be an idea people are anxious, but I definitely do not suggest anybody not take vaccines, um, but that's where I stand from a medical evidence-based uh, approach. Um, and so like we talked, recent research has gluten sensitivity to be a relationship. I've seen it on and off in terms of kids who, because gluten diet is pretty hard. Uh, and when people do it, it's a lot of work. And when, and I've, I've found kids who really do well when they stop gluten and I've seen kids who actually may not do great. Uh, or do the same. So it's hard to say, but there is some evidence to that. Um, and it's abnormalities in the brain development. It's neuroatypical, right? So I, for uh, discussion sake, I'm going to call kids who do not have autism neurotypical and, and neuroatypical is kind of different. And I feel like it's just there. They're just unique. They're different brain. And our society is not geared towards that. Although I have to say with COVID and everybody isolating and everybody being having conversations online, and social communication is different now and it's changing with generations in how we communicate all kids text um, and what it means to have that sort of lack of social communications changing in a lot of ways. So brain scans have showed no difference in shape and structure and genetically like any other disease odds increase of a parent or sibling has autism. So we, we're just, this is DSM-4, DSM-5. These are the books that psychiatrists look through to kind of make these labels and say, okay, yeah, uh, for me, labeling means nothing. It's just a way to communicate between providers and professionals. It's just a way to say, okay, this is it. So an autism spectrum disorder, I feel like is a broader spectrum. It's That's why it's called a spectrum because it could, I've seen kids who have mild, mild struggles to really being normal, bro, having a lot of struggles. So, so it's, uh, DSM-5 is a book uh, that insurances would love us to label people so they can pay us or uh, communicate with therapists and other professionals. So that's where we look into. And according to DSM-5, there's a lot of restricted repetitive behaviors, interests that they constantly have, um, keep doing. Uh, repetitive motor moments, they have uh, a certain way of moving the hands constantly, flipping objects. They're constantly bu busy doing the same repetitive motor uh, moments. Uh, and then they're usually like 
um, there's a lot of inflexibility in schedules and they like things to happen in routines. Um, and I feel like there's room for that in terms of anxiety, right? So I want to bring that top point here is people who are, who like, we, we all sometimes like schedules and we like things and it's harder for us, but uh, in autism, uh, there's a, uh, there's a higher, uh, the chance of feeling inflexible, the higher chance of feeling that they can't, they have to be rigid to things and difficulty with transitions. And they're highly restricted, fixated interests, abnormal intensity. So people can like something, but when in an autistic child, there's a higher intensity of wanting to like those things and feeling um, that there's more focus, more than normal. Um, they could be hyper or hypoactive to sensory input. It's a big thing. Um, sometimes autism kind of has a lot more similarity to sensory processing disorder. So people who have sensory processing disorder, which hasn't even been understood in deeper detail of how that happens, but they're more uh, sensitive to tags, sensitive to touch, sensitive to how they eat food or what kind of food they eat and how they feel about it. And then it has to be developed, early development period. For a long time, DSM-4 called it by age three. Now it's kind of changed it and sort of left it a little more open to say, hey, it has to be when you can't turn 17 and say, you do not have social skills and I'm autistic. So you really have to have kind of had some of these symptoms early on. And what is surprising to me is I still see adults who come in there and this, they have poor eye contact and low social skills and nobody's ever diagnosed them with autism. They've never got the help. And it's never talked about. So, and I wanted to bring up this point here in terms of is autism increasing in numbers or, and we'll talk about it knowing from what you think, because you, from your organization perspective, you've done all the research anyway. So you probably can tell, put some, some say some more things there, but I feel like it's 50, 50. Yes, there's an increased uh, prevalence and in incidence of uh, autism. We're seeing more of this, of course, our environmental factors. We see eat a lot of dyes lot of foods. Um, I remember one of my autistic uh, parents sort of once mentioned uh, kids eat cupcakes and the cupcakes, uh, the cream and the frosting sort of was set on a couch and it took her forever to clean the couch. You can only imagine what it's doing to the gut lining when we're eating all of these things. So certainly the incidence of any kind of diseases with the kind of food we eat are higher uh, and we have less control on it uh, in terms of what's available and how much uh, we can change that part. Um, but there's also, I feel like there's also more awareness. People are more understanding of what it means. Uh, there's a lot more buying into early intervention. And so we see a lot more increase in um, what we're seeing in autism. But symptoms have to be clinically significant impairment. So so it's not just that, oh, I'm, I do not have the social skills or I, I have some struggles with motor skills, but it really has to affect clinically and have some dysfunctionality level. Um, and they should not be explained by other disorders, right? So there's intellectual disability, global development delay, uh, and how do you differentiate? Although intellectual disability can be present with autism, uh, and um, but it should just be beyond, the social communication should be so lower than what the what they're def defining the intellectual disability to be at. So if the kid's uh, eight and has a fourth grade intellectual disability, intellectual level, their social skills should be on par for fourth grader. And if not, then we really talk about is this autism or is this intellectual disability? And then, you know, there was always this whole thing about how Asperger's, pervasive, they're all being clubbed in. Um, they have to meet all of these criteria and we want to make sure it doesn't, they do not have social communication disorders. And the biggest part is we really have to work through differential diagnosis, which is so important because there's some amount of global delay, there's uh, some amount of social communication disorders, sensory processing disorders. So we need to work on having a differential diagnosis always. Um, 2018 prevalence rate, they looked at it. So it's it's pretty common, one in 59 children. That's a huge number. Um, and you know, and you can't uh, undeny those numbers in any way. They've seen it affects four males to one female. So there's one to 39 boys, there's one to 52 girls. Um, intellectual disabilities may or may not be present, but uh, the good news is 44% of the average about, are above average uh, intellectual abilities. 25% uh, is on borderline and 31% have intellectual disabilities. And sometimes I feel like there's always comorbidities, something ex existing along with autism. And that's a big thing in autism. Lots of people have other diseases um, or other struggles with ADHD. Um, and, you know, pardon me, I know I use autism as a disease because I'm a physician and it, for me in my brain, 
how can we support this disease? So, but it, I think with the numbers that are so high, I almost have kind of gone to say, uh, are we seeing kids as we move forward more of, uh, um, will autistic kids be the generation in a way of how they communicate because all our kids are kind of going and really re relearning to understand maybe autism just is there and it's gonna be there uh, instead of calling it a disease or wanting for a cure, just learning how to kind of help these kids um, change the world around them. So, so who does this, right? We, how do you find out uh, who has autism? Uh, it's always done by trained professionals. So they could be researchers, they could be psychologists, neurologists, pediatricians, psychiatrists fall in it. I, I often say it feel is less important than expertise because I, I feel like whoever has a lot more, because you can go to a primary care physician, they may not understand it, or a psychiatrist who may not understand it as much as somebody who's a pediatrician who's doing it all the time and every time. So definitely feels important knowing that somebody has the expertise helps. Um, and it's always an interdisciplinary approach because you want to rule out other, is there occupational therapy uh, assessments? Is there social pragmatic disorder assessment? So we've got it takes a lot of people to get together to kind of put that diagnosis in so many ways. Um, and then how do you diagnose if people ask you history, history, developmental history is when you were born, how was pregnancy, uh, what, what kind of struggles you had and how was growing up and um, when, when they reach the milestones and things like that. A lot of observations, right? Parent comes to you and tells you, I've seen my kid repetitively walk around the room constantly or turn around, uh, twirl around so often. And then direct interaction is a big part of how much of eye contact there is, what kind of social skills there are. There's a parent interview, then there's evaluation of social communication, sensory, emotional, cognitive, and other behaviors. So we, we do a complete assessment of those. So it happens in multiple centers. Sometimes it happens at therapist's office, then you go to a psychiatrist or a pediatrician who kind of goes through all these reports and finds their own observation before they make the diagnosis. So when can autism be diagnosed? And I'm, we're gonna talk a little more about this, but I just wanted to put out some pointers is as early as year one, you don't see big smiles, other warm, joyful expressions by six months, no back and forth sharing of sounds, smiles, no babbling by 12 months, no back and forth gestures like pointing, showing, reaching uh, for things or waving, no words by 16 months and no meaningful two word phrases. Usually most times it's two years that parents come to a physician and say, hey, we're not seeing that kind of communication. Uh, and then suddenly any loss of speech, babbling or social skills at any age. Okay, the answer, I think the biggest answer is, and we'll talk a little bit about what early intervention means is earlier, the better. The early, the only thing we really know in autism and what helps is intervention. And the earlier you get that intervention, it's better. So American Academy of Pedi Pediatricians uh, looked into this. What below three age, age three, they said beginning as early as possible, having active family members involvement, combination of approaching this from a developmental and behavioral approaches, addressing special specific uh, social communication delays and developmental issues, and really considering if there's medical issues that may affect behavior, what kind of responsive intervention you have and kind of saying, hey, if this is ADHD, how can we treat the ADHD that's happening with autism? and things like that. So really those were the top things that they saw and was helpful. And what are all these interventions targeting at? They're targeting at attention imitation, what is the engagement and motivation, the communication skills, and a lot of life skills and motor skills. So there's a lot of specific areas you pick and specifically target and make those interventions. So the answer usually is applied behavioral analysis. The only answer for autism right now we have is uh, this therapy, which is called applied behavioral analysis. It's basically a science of behavioral change. So you kind of identify what prompts the behavior, then you kind of do the intervention, and then you see change. So you're sort of controlling uh, in a scientific method, how can you bring behavioral improvements by prescribed intervention? So you bring in the intervention and change that behavior. And I find really that's very interesting with how um, it works really well in kids and what their brain can be able to modulate in a way and change. Um, the ABCs of ABA, right? There's uh, antecedent and then there's behavior and there's consequences, which means you have you first happen to have uh, do things before the behavior, then you bring in the child response and then you kind of wait for the outcome of behavior. So. Uh, that's their real principles on what uh, ABA is based on. Um, 
I just use this example to really explain that is um, if a child sits, stands in front of the closed door and it's not really say things, parents constantly prompt the child to stay open. And the child sort of gets to the point of behavior of open and then the parents bring in the concept of opening their behavior. So the child learns a word, learns a behavior, understands, uh, and they constantly repeat it. Repetition, repetition, repetition is the answer in ABA. So the, the interventions happen to have usually zero to nine years. That's kind of where all the research goes on. So into, the earlier the intervention, the better. And you're doing it in different settings. So it's, if you're doing ABA, I know, I, I tell people, if this is my child, I'm going to put them. I know particularly as we kind of, uh, just picking and dropping to school is hard work. But now we're adding on this extra work and it's, sometimes it's exhausting. It's exhausting just to pick and drop kids from school. So I can't even imagine how exhausting, but services are available in so many settings. So they're going to OT, they're going to speech, they're going to do ABA and they're doing other therapies. So it happens in a lot of setting. And often having a one-to-one -one teacher student ratio is known to be beneficial. And then peer training for older kids based on modeling. How do you improve their focus on social and communication aspects? Which I have to say, I, I just find it, all kids this, in this generation really needs a lot of peer training, a lot of social groups. They're sitting in one group and they're on phones. So uh, almost like they do not have the social skills. Um, and then really kind of working on schedules and that's a big, big struggle and where the anxiety sort of shows up or um, change is hard. Change is hard for all of us. But think about this being a kid and uh, your brain is not trained to like change, then it's even more harder. And how do you support those? And how do you kind of make um, calendar schedules, bring in, um, how can you take in unpredictability? So th there's a lot of work that goes in there. And then self-management. Initially, when the child is younger, you can almost say, okay, I'm going to say door, open the door and you see this. As a kid gets older, you really want to find that the kid is able to identify their own target behavior. So what is that um, that causes me to find it hard for change? And how you do you bring that? And really monitoring. So the reward is not based on bringing the change, but more on identifying the targets and uh, really seeking um, those things that really cause stress. And then you get the reward and you're sort of changing that behavior. And last comes medication management. Uh, really, I feel like... Um, as a psychiatrist, my role falls in into sort of identifying comorbidities, right? So, you know, uh, is there an ADHD I can treat? Is there an anxiety? So when I say I'm treating autism, I'm not treating autism, autism, I'm treating the other associated struggles that we have, right? Because I have kids who kind of put them on Zoloft, which is an antidepressant anxiety medication to help them move forward in terms of, hey, this change is so hard, but when I'm calm, I'm able to make this change. And do we need sometimes medication to help them engage in that kind of uh, thing? Because now you brought in something that helps them calm down so they can engage more or process the therapy more. ADHD, huge uh, comorbidity on that. A lot of kids have ADHD with autism, so they have difficulty participating in therapies. So when I treat the ADHD, we, we see change because they're really sitting down and engaging in therapy um, because they're unable to do that without medication sometimes. Making sure mood disorders, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is a label that we kind of use. It's a very uh, basket diagnosis, I say, that we put it on for people and to say, hey, I can't tolerate change, so I kind of get aggressive and I'm overwhelmed, and that's my response to things. Uh, sometimes it, behavioral interventions is the answer, but sometimes you really need some medication just to help you calm down and be able to kind of get through. And sometimes it's really caregiver burnout. You're constantly doing so much work uh, that it's, it's that whole, how do we support the family so they can kind of get through this in some ways. So that's where the treatment of mood disorders come in. And nutritional psychiatry, again, like there's so much more yet to be known, but uh, definitely the food we're taking in. We are who we eat and how do we work on that? Um, so that's where I am with autism. I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to let Noreen talk about screen scare screening hers. Right. Awesome, Noreen. I'm going to let you take over and. Can you? Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so, first off, let me just. just okay. All right. First off, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone, and Ramadan Mubarak. Um, I wanted to bring, I mean, 
a more community aspect of it, what we've seen, I have been so fortunate to be part of a, a wonderful organization um, that I'll talk about uh, and, you know, who uh, has been around. I mean, they, it's been a, there's no particular founder, but they have been working endlessly and relentlessly for the last, I want to say eight years at least, because I mean, it's been five at least since I've seen and heard of them, but um, you know, they started off with a couple of parents who, you know, who are, who have kids who are not just on with autism, but other, um, you know, uh, abilities. And they, they have worked with ICBC and Alhamdulillah, we finally were, they were able to start a organization. Um, and, you know, we've been very blessed to be able to part of, be part of it and uh, do events and activities that, you know, bring awareness. Um, so I'll touch a bit on that first. It's CHAMP. Um, CHAMP is championing, championing and assisting Muslim people. ACBC launched a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support group for parents with special needs. Um, and we just have been recently, I, I want to say October or November, uh, we're certified by the Muslim organization, which I don't know um, how many have heard, but it is uh, mainly by Omar Salaman, um, Sheikh Omar Salaman, and he, it's a, it's a national North America wide uh, organization that helps um, improve experiences within the mosques, as well as, you know, perform umrahs with parents and families with special needs. They have a, a plethora of activities that they do as well on a more national level. Um, I wanted to talk about CHAMP because, you know, the, it's a huge, a huge, uh, uh, thing that we've come across now. I mean, you know, I've been in the community for about eight years and it has grown. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know, again, I don't have the scientific numbers, you know, or backing to say autism is increasing or not. I think that the awareness is happening now. There's more awareness in the community where people are able to say, okay, you know, uh, we are, you know, so-and-so I've seen that child. So maybe it's time to evaluate mine or, you know, there's so much more talk about it as opposed to 10, 15 years ago. Um, schools have become more inclusive where we're having World Autism Month and we have, you know, wear blue for autism and, you know, people are talking about it. So I think it's becoming more and more aware. Um, and as far as like the, the boys to girls ratio, also the other thing is girls are hard to detect because they tend to mask it a lot. Um, so finding that is also equally important to uh, detecting it in girls. Um, boys have usually a very different mannerism compared to girls and you know it takes it takes a little bit of more effort trying to see you know what because girls try to pretend like they are their peers or their friends and they say things their mannerisms are very you know uh, they'll cover it up um, and you know so uh, those are things that I think that it's becoming more prevalent in our community we're seeing these things and we're calling you know um, you know we're calling on them and uh, it's, it's, it's a work in progress, I want to say. Um, with the CHAMP, we, you know, there's activities, you know, there was a time there, it was very difficult to come into the masjid without, you know, uh, getting glared at or people making comments. And now I think that, uh, people are coming to that understanding. Yesterday, alhamdulillah, it was amazing that we had a, I, I want to say he's at least 16 or 17. He was in the girl, he was in the women's area. Um, he got a few stares and people came and asked like, hey, what's going on? And, you know, I was able to explain to them like, this is, you know, so-and-so is special needs and this is, we're trying to accommodate. He cannot be without his mother. And so they, I mean, alhamdulillah, it was mind blowing to see everyone just supporting him, you know, just pretending like there was nothing different. It was just another, you know, we've come a long way. Um, I think that as a community, we are coming a long way and it's, it's always going to be um, a, you know, it's, it's a, it's, you know, as they say, it takes a village. It really does take a village. It takes a village to understand, you know, what these parents, what these families go through, um, having compassion, you know, uh, as a community. And this is not anything new. A lot of people uh, have this like notion that, oh, autism is a new thing. It's not new. It's been around, you know, even from the prophetic days. So we have hadith that support, talk about, you know, um, uh, kids that had, or, or kids that have special needs or, you know, adults that had special needs. And so we are, you know, we're trying to make it so that these families don't feel like they are causing 
some kind of a distraction or they're coming in and they're disrupting the community, they're disrupting iftar or, you know, making sure that we are more accepting towards families that have special needs because it's hard. It's very hard to have kids and you don't know. And then on top of that, you're alone because no one there's, you know, I mean, you cannot go into a community and go talk to your friends and expect them to understand if they don't have uh, the same type of, you know, experiences. Um, people usually just nod or whatever. So Alhamdulillah, it's Champ has become a, a, a sisterhood, a brotherhood, a familyhood, if you will, um, of community members who have just bond together. Yesterday, you know, last week, every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, ICBC has community of stars. And so, you know, we've had a number of parents that come in and they're like, well, I'm planning to bring my child, you know? And so we have some wonderful other sisters who said, you know, we're going to bring these activities for them, or we'll do this and we'll do this. And we kind of just band together and work together to make sure that not only are they welcomed, but they're also able to be taken care of while the mother is trying to play salah. Um, the men, the, the dads are now finally getting, you know, they're, they're also involved now. They're trying to get their own um, group. It's, it's nice to be able to just decompress and you know initially before Ramadan and inshallah I'll start back up post Ramadan we have a mother support group as well so we meet once you know once this first Saturday or of every month and it's just basically you know we they're so the mothers the fathers they tend to be caregivers they're so focused on their children their you know the well-being of their children that they sometimes forget to take care of themselves so, you know, this is another opportunity for mothers and fathers to be able to, you know, get together and just talk over coffee or over whatever and just talk about their challenges. And, you know, while CHAMP is not just for autism, it's a great learning experience because sometimes parents with autism that have kids with autism, they have nothing, no information whatsoever about ADHD or, you know, any other disability. Um, and like like Afsha said, it's 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 an ability. I I want to say it's just a different programming. There's nothing necessarily. It's not, you know. I think you're talking about from a medical perspective. Yes, the the terminology disease. I think will slowly start fading away because I think it's just a a uh, it's a different way of thinking. You know. I mean, sometimes we agree to disagree. Well, this is a different way. Their brain is functions in a different way, but it doesn't mean it's any less. And so they are able to completely, uh, you know, talk and it, it, they might have delays, yes. And with the early intervention, you know, there's lots of possibilities, but I think there, some of these kids that have autism have very unique ways of thinking. Um, it's very interesting to see their answers sometimes. They think out of the box and that's kind of what we want. I mean, you know, what fun would the world be if we all thought the same way? Um, but anyway, I mean, ICBC Champ has, you know, they they have worked very hard to start this community, this group, and you know, I mean, we had in October, I want to say October, we had a. It's funny, I I, I couldn't actually remember, but this this uh, one of the attendees, he's you know, he he reminded me the exact date and time that we met for our uh, autism Thanksgiving um, fall festival. So we had gotten together at the All Abilities Park in Round Rock and we did various activities um, together as a group. And it was a great opportunity for people, not only just in ICBC, but outside of ICBC that are maybe, because right now uh, NAMCC is still working with trying to get, you know, Musin approved, inshallah, there we are taking baby steps because CHAMP in ICBC has just been flourishing. Um, and I can tell you, I mean, in the last eight years, I remember just two or three people being part of the community of, you know, for CHAMP. And now, Alhamdulillah, we have many, many people um, that are part of the community, the CHAMP community. Um, and so, you know, we, we had a fall festival. We have various activities um, before Ramadan. The first day of Ramadan, we also had a Ramadan festival where the kids got to come in and it's all walks of life, all ages. Uh, you know, um, and they all came and worked together. They did their own little Eid crafts. It, 
it really is. I mean, there's sometimes like, you know, we'll, we'll all work together to, hey, these are some activities. Somebody, you know, want to take lead on this or, you know, usually I like doing the activities because I'm, you know, I have fun with the art and crafts aspect of it. Um, and this time we had it at ICBC and, you know, it was very nice. It was very nice to be able to come. We're all fasting. It was, you know, but it was very heartwarming to see some of the reactions, the kids being able to come and into our masjid and be welcomed and be able to sit there and be part of it. Uh, we all want that for our kids, right? We all want to be able to have that connection from an early standpoint. We want our masjid to be our, you know, where we, you know, like hang out, where the kids not only come for salat, but also just hang out. You know, that's the whole purpose of building these multi-purpose rooms and game rooms and all of these so that our kids are connected to the masjid. So then it shouldn't be any different for kids with special needs. So it was really joy, uh, you know, joyful watching these, you know, and some of them are older and it's just so sweet to see them equally excited as the younger kids because they were truly having, a, a, you know, an, a, like enjoying their time um, making these crafts. And inshallah, inshallah, we hope to, continue doing those doing those in the future, maybe for Eid and spring and just continuously bringing them into the community and into the masjid so that their faces are recognized by other members so that they are familiar with being able to not, you know, as uh, Afshan was saying, sometimes it's location, sometimes it's repetition that takes, you know, that helps. And so coming to the masjid over and over and over again and seeing certain rooms and learning how to go up the stairs and then this is where you need to go just helps them put that file in the brain so that they know that, okay, we're coming to a safe space. We're not going to somewhere new where, you know, we, we have a tantrum. It's, we know this place is familiar. So that's the, that's the goal of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you are wanting to, I know a lot of parents, you know, they'll, will have conversations at the masjid and they'll talk to me about it. So if you ever want to be part of the community, it is open, not just to ICBC, but also for uh, other masjids as well. It's, um, you can email champ at ICBC, uh, uh, brushycreek.org. Um, and they will add you. We have a WhatsApp group for the moms. We have a WhatsApp group for the dads now, inshallah. They had the first dads meeting uh, not too long ago before Ramadan. Um, just to meet and greet, know, you know, when we see, it's it's just like, we see you, you know? If you need anything during, like, we know, it's okay. Um, and so, yeah. And then we also have volunteer uh, opportunities for neurotypical kids. I really love this because I we have kids that are, not on the spectrum, not in anything, they're neurotypical. And they come because they have a sibling or they have, they want to, it's great to get, you know, college credit or high school credit or volunteer hours in, but it's also one thing to be able to come in and say, we see these kids and they're just like us. And they might be in the same age group and they'll see someone that has, you know, a special ability and they'll understand it's more, it's allowing our children to be more compassionate towards their peers. So it's a wonderful opportunity that we do. And we've been blessed to have, you know, um, some neurotypical kids and their families come in and they want to be part of it and they volunteer and they sit there with the crafts. I mean, we end up sometimes, last time we had about 30 kids. So in that 30 kids, you know, I mean, there's only like a few of us that can walk around. So some of these kids came in and they were sitting one-on-one -on -one telling them how to do it and what to do. So it's pretty phenomenal. Um, so that's the link as well, um, if you would like to volunteer. Um, and then I wanted to move on to social media. Uh, we have, I mean, outside of the masjid, outside of everything, if people are, you know, if you're concerned, if you're still not there yet, where you're ready to go and get a diagnosis, there's, pl there's plenty of options just in Austin um, uh, that have, you know, that they're, there, social media is everything these days. I mean, people are on their phones all the time and you could Google search everything. But I, I like you, like a friend said, there's, there's another level of personal, you know, um, connections and finding personal experiences. So the, I wanted to highlight a couple of places that I really, really like on Facebook and Instagram. Austin Society, Autism Society of Texas, is uh you know a texas based they're all over texas um they're changing lives by connecting families and individuals to community resources and supports so it really deals with just texas home base um you know whether it be houston or dallas or wherever 
they, in, you know, they, they have a lot of the activities that are going on. Um, they talk about, you know, what seminars are happening. Uh, they'll have it on their Facebook and Instagram. Um, Autism Speaks is more of a national level of uh, an organization. They are the ones that we tend to, you know, donate to. They are the ones that will be funding, help funding a lot of these um, other activities that happen. Sometimes they'll get, you know, like when Autism Society of Texas, if there's an event and they need some money, then they reach out to Autism Speaks. So they are kind of like the more national level. Um, and they are dedicated to promoting solutions across the spectrum and uh, throughout the lifespan for the needs of uh, people with autism and their families. Um, you know, with Texas being Texas, there's, you know, it's always been a, a little bit of a challenge with um, finding the right amount of resources and with insurance coming in and all of that. So Autism Speak is, is a place where they also, you know, they, they help you there's places where you can find out like what what services are available in other states and um you know and what what life is like in other states outside of texas they also um have a lot of resources that are like that help detect kind of like the earlier part of this uh slideshow they talk about um like what are some early detections what are some you know uh at home things that you can do to kind of get ahead of the ball game um you know i mean just being able to understand, you know, what you're seeing. The, this is a great organization. Um, and, you know, they do the autism walk every year in April. Uh, uh, April 2nd is autism, World Autism Day. So, and then all of April is uh, Autism Month. So they have various activities that they also post on a national level. And then the last one is Austin uh, Special Needs for Parents. It's a Facebook page. And this is one of my favorite pages because it's a very local and very, you can relate um, because it's within Austin. It's just, you know, and they talk about what's happening in schools or what's happening with insurance or what's happening in one ABA center versus another ABA center. What are local activities that are happening? It's very, you know, I mean, this is where you'll hear about like the movie nights um, or, you know, like the coffee with Java, with you know, uh, coffee and Java with moms or whatever. Like it'll be more of a, a community page that you can, outside of our Islamic community, where you can meet, potentially meet um, parents from the same schools or, you know, um, so this is, you know, and there, there are some more smaller ones, like specifically towards Cedar Park, for example, or there's another one that's like Pflugerville and Round Rock. So they have other smaller groups, but I think Austin Special Needs Parents page has been um, one of the best resources, uh, at least for myself. Um, and I know for a lot of others, like you, if, if you have a question, there's a good chance that it's been asked on this page um, and you'll have, you know, not just one answer, most, more than likely, a lot of people jump in and they have their experiences and they love to share it. And so it's always good to have um, some local and more personal experiences and places that you can refer to that are, you know, that you can actually go to. Um, so additional resources. Um, so there's uh, supplemental special education services provided by TEA. Um, Texas Education uh, Association, I want to say. Um, and so $1,500 is a grant that they allowed for one time for eligible parents, caregivers, for students that are um, in the school system as is considered as special needs. If they have any of the, you know, IEPs in place, if they have uh, any sort of special needs and approved of special needs, it's on their website, um, they have uh they have these um this grant available for people um to apply for there is a wait list and it's first come first serve basis but it's there's no harm in obviously joining it's like a five minute thing you just get your student number from your uh from the school and you you know you just sign up and when you get it you get it i've heard a lot of parents you know uh again on that previous page that i was referring to the facebook page is where it came across um about it and they talk about you know how they used it for ABA, for example, and or occupational therapy, any of their therapy uh, services that you know that you might have a copay for. Um, and then they also have one uh, like for horse therapy. There's there's lots of other options out there as far as like aside from your OT, um, PT, and ABA and speech therapy. There's also like 
they have in um, Leander, for example, they have a ranch where they have horses. And so some of these kids that are on the spectrum, they come and they ride horses and it's a, it's a way of therapy, it calms them down, it centers them. And so these are, it's a rescue center. And so these horses have been abused in the past and all that, so they've been rescued. And then these children come in and they bond with these horses. And so that fee is, you know, the, the, whatever the fee is, is used to take care of those horses. So this money could go towards that. Or if there's something that you wanted to do for your child, um, you know, like martial arts or whatever, um, art, there's, this money could be used for that as well. And then um, a lot of us are always very weary about babysitters. Um, so I wanna talk about spectrum sitters. This is geared for kids with special needs um, and mainly autism. I mean, you, it's very, uh, they're trained professionals who know that they've worked with special needs children before. So it's a very good opportunity. Um, you know, if you ever just wanna get out, I, I, I emphasize on parents' um, mental, uh, you know, being, being uh, you know, taking care of yourself, taking a moment, because it is a lot. It is a lot to be a parent of a special needs kid or, uh, you know, it, it takes a toll. And so making sure that you're able to, you know, if you ever wanted to go out or just take some time to yourself and don't have a sitter or are always just worried about, you know, who do I call? What if, you know, these guys are specialized. They are trained to work with kids such as ours, um, such as, you know, kids with autism or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty simple um, process to get signed up for that. Um, and then I don't have a slide for the next one, but I, you know, it, it's very important to talk about touch base on this as well is um, I wanted to point out your local school districts. It's very imperative that you work with your local, we pay taxes, we pay lots of taxes on our schools and public schools are geared. They have the, the uh, they have the funding. I mean, they should have the funding and they have the resources um, to help our children that have special needs to be able to work with them, to make them start early. There's early intervention programs that are provided by both, you know, pretty much every LISD here in Austin, um, you know, where they start at the age of three. Uh, you go in and you, you have your child evaluated. If you have any, you know, doubt, uh, they do their own evaluation um, separate from your doctors, but they will do their own evaluation and they'll decide from an educational standpoint, will this child be ready for kindergarten? Will this child need additional services? Is it good to just start ahead? And, you know, I mean, I say this, I, I firmly believe, you know, if, if, if it means that your child is going to not only do well or even potentially excel, why not? It's free services that you are paying for uh, through your taxes. And I think that, you know, it's a very good opportunity and advantage to take uh, uh, to take because, I mean, it's there and they work. I mean, there's ELE, there's ESLE, there's SLE. There's all these programs that have been put in place in the public st school systems that are supposed to uh, support your child. If you have any questions or, you know, they will help along with therapy. And again, early intervention is key. It's, it's, I'm a firm believer of early, early intervention as well, because that's when their brains are still growing. They're still able to, you're still able to mold them. They're like sponges. They're just taking everything in right now. So it's a good, it's a good opportunity to start them early. And, you know, I mean, it's, you will have an IEP put in place for your child. Um, and they, it's a set of goals. What an IEP is basically a set of goals that they have for your child to achieve by the end of the year. And then at the end of the year, we have an ARD. And that art meeting is with the teachers that were, you know, the teachers, the therapists, because schools also have speech therapists, occupational therapists, um, and physical therapists on, on campus that will come in and work with your child. It might not be the same as um, per, like privatized uh, therapies, but it's still something. It's still something to get started with. They have, um, you know, they'll have certain programs and they'll work with you at the end of the year. You're able to say, yes, I want, you could always speak up. Um, I always say, you know, be very firm. If you have any questions, that is your, your floor to talk and say, you know what, I don't like this goal. Maybe we should change it into this goal. Or I would like you to add another goal. I see this at home. Maybe this is something you can look at into here. So those are some of the things that um, we, we, like I, I encourage, um, 
for parents, like talk about, you know, what, what is in your IEP, make sure that you're comfortable with it. Make sure that you're using the resources that are available um, before you, you know, start. It's, it's always good to do both, but if you want to just get a head start, uh, three years is when they start, um, you know, and then the, 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 the government owned uh, entity also has, I mean, we have, um, I think Blue Bonnet uh, services out in Georgetown. They are by the county, you know, you can, by the government, you can also sign up through there if your child is medically diagnosed. And so that is, those services are available to you up until the child turns three, but then the public services, public schools take over from three and onwards. Um, and this is, they have support until at least until the time they graduate, if not until 21, depending on how that works. Um, you know, and there are tons of opportunities in schools that they have. There's like after, you know, if you have an 18 year old or a 16 year old and you're thinking, okay, you know, my, my 16 year old, I, I'm gonna need support after he or she graduates, what now? There are services out there through the school district that will tell you like, hey, we we have these services available for up till 21, you know? Um, so there are things out there, it's just tapping into what we have and utilizing them. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, really look into your, you know, and if you're seeing something with your child that you're not fully caught, you know, comfortable, something's not going well, like the grades are not coming in, Call an ARD, You're, you are the parent. You have the right to call an ARD and see why your child is not getting those services. Why is my child not doing? They have teachers that come into classrooms and work with your child. Um, they'll spend some time. It might be your child alone or it might be two or three. It'll be a little breakout area where they're able to talk and, you know, and go over. Sometimes it's just instructions, not being able to, you know, if I'm giving out instructions super fast, I know that the child who might, you know, some neurotypical kids don't understand, let alone sometimes it's the amount of words, the speed, the, you know, the way I, the, the teacher might say it. it, it all depends. So these um, aides come into the classroom and they work with your child. They say, hey, you know, this is what you need to do. Maybe it's the tone, like they, they'll work with your child to make sure that, you know, that they're understanding what they're where they're taking uh, under, you know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, a lot of us think about star testing and the, just testing in general. There are uh, like uh, other options. Um, you know, you are not required to take star testing. You can emit star testing based off of special needs. You can also have it done verbally if you would like. You can have someone sit there if you need someone. If your child is not able to hold a pencil, they can do the answers verbally. There's plenty, like I said, there's uh, lots of options out there for you to tap into. It's just, you know, for your description. And, you know, I mean, I would highly recommend uh, utilizing those. Um, and you are, you know, if, if anybody ever has questions, they're more than welcome to post it on those, the, you know, the, the, the parents page, reach out to, you know, I mean, there's lots of, uh, again, from the masjid as well now they're you know they're doing more activities that are geared towards special it, it's inshallah i mean i think that with the numbers whether they be growing or whether we're detecting it more or whatever it may be i think that as a community I, alhamdulillah we're coming you know we're treading along and it's it's going for the good um so yeah that's that's kind of where i want to end it off with uh and give it back to afshan and i'm gonna stop sharing Oh, no, Rin. thank you very much. I mean, I truly, truly believe this. Um, we've come a long way and I really appreciate Champ's uh, and Mawson's efforts. I, I've never said this a lot to a lot of people, but I got in psychiatry to get into forensics. Forensic psychiatry was my thing. Um, and then one of my best friends uh, from med school, she's a physician and she had two kids with autism. Um, it changed her life forever in terms of, I mean, I feel like I've lost her and then Lately, as the kids grow up and are doing better, she's kind of returning in a way. But uh, but the toll it takes on uh, caregiver burnout, we do not talk about it. But knowing like your people around you who have, hey, this is who I am and this is, I have these things. And then ha finding that same kind of people is such an important thing. I remember 14 years ago, um, I was in Dallas. I did my residency at UT Southwestern. And uh, there was this mom who was a block away from Irving Masjid. And I, I used to go to that masjid at that time. and um, 
we failed her as a community. She was single. I think I can't remember if her husband was in the picture or not, but she was so isolated. She she lived in an apartment. She had two kids who had uh, who were on the spectrum and she was sort of struggling. She couldn't take her them to the masjid because they wouldn't really accommodate her. Um, and I remember she got depressed and paranoid that she poisoned the kids and went to prison. So, but I felt like, I felt like as a community, we failed her terribly for not supporting. So I really appreciate all the efforts. And even with my friend, the kind of caregiver burnout, she's lost herself. Mom, especially, like you said, they don't take care of themselves. They, they're focused on the child. And I, as a parent who just drops and picks my kids up, I feel like that's already exhausting. So imagine telling these parents that, okay, you can't do anything else, but you have to do this therapy, this therapy, this therapy. So there's a huge, and knowing that there are other people are doing it, knowing that the whole community supports you and there's still room for improvement. I feel like um, that number of volunteers need to go up drastically. Um, and where is that work that needs to happen in terms of how do we as community kind of take this as our responsibility rather than, okay, this is the parent, which I have to say, Alhamdulillah, we have come a long way from years that I've seen used to see all of these parents and aunties who would kind of be upset that the namaz is getting disturbed versus now feeling like, okay, yeah, you know, there was this artistic kid, mashallah, he was so happy on Eid, he was walking around, but he had this balloon thing, which he kept strapping everybody around with. <laughs> but but I was so impressed by the aunties who did not flinch or didn't get bothered. So we're coming a long way, mashallah, in terms of understanding, but that's it, education and awareness. And like you said, it, I always believe is, what is neurotypical, neuroatypical? Maybe, you know, I... I sort of tease my middle child is saying maybe she has she's on the spectrum because sometimes she doesn't pick up on the social cues and that's where we're going it's a spectrum right it's a spectrum in terms of some kids with so much of social media do not pick up on social cues and this is just a little more on the other end how do we support it an early intervention I don't know if you know about horse boy um have you seen that documentary horse boy no so it's an Austin based um I think it's in Mainers but um one of the families have this kid uh, who is a poster child for horse boy in a way because equine therapy is kind of the answer. And I am a strong believer of equine therapy for my patients too, because I feel like that's that's a big part of um, uh, really they, the way they look at it is the moment on a horse makes your brain release this chemical oxytocin, which is what uh, moms when they're breastfeeding have that hormone. So it helps them relax and participate. So I strongly, strongly recommend equine therapy because I feel like they plays a huge role in, and like you said, being around horses, being able to take care of them, that whole um, nature versus um, what that effects on your brain are, but equine therapy is a big thing. The other thing I also want to talk about is schools. Um, I feel like the more squeaky the wheel, the more grease it gets. Uh, I know we are strapped for finances in terms of resources at schools, with COVID it's even worse, but, really identifying and being educated, right? That's the whole part of how do you advocate for your child? If you know, like it's as simple as, can they have an aide who can just simplify the instructions? Can they have somebody who's, because a teacher taking care of 26 kids is a lot, it's a lot for the teachers. So how do we kind of get our child to have that support and constantly going back, having those meetings, or the meeting. And I don't know how many of you all were there part of the beginning. We were talking about going to an Islamic school. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the examples. I'm, I'm curious what you've kind of seen the parents in the community in terms of Renaissance, APA, Harmony. And... I, I, I believe that, you know, I mean, honestly, the funding is not there for some of these private schools and not just Islamic schools, but any, you know, even Christian based schools, other schools, yep. because that's not their target market. They're trying to target towards other groups, mostly neurotypical kids. They don't have I mean, I, I, there's like one or two schools that I know of that is specifically for, it's a privatized school, Magnolia, um, that is that is for kids with autism. Um, and, you know, and that, and I use this term because I dislike it, but high functioning kids, not even, you know, they have to have certain uh, requirements in order to get into Magnolia. But I think that the schools are not, the private schools are not uh, built for, or they don't, uh, that's not the special needs families are not their target market and they don't necessarily have sometimes most of the time they're just trying to stay afloat and so whatever their resources are bare minimum or whatever it could be they try to get that done first right and you know with Islamic schools we have the foundation we have kids that are you know but then 
they don't know what to do after. If they have this one off or two off children, they don't have a specific or you know department that deals with these kids. So it's usually the the teacher that's within the classroom that either picks it up or does not. And so you know it, the child might be considered deviant and continuously gets in trouble. But I mean, you know, a while ago somebody had told me eight is too late. And that's because it, eight years and onwards, it's when it starts getting harder and harder for kids to, you know, get therapies and actually there, it, it could happen, but early intervention is always, you know, more, more appreciated and more, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and so, you know, it, with these prime years of like four and five and pre-K and kindergarten and when, when kids are going to these schools, more than likely, they might not even get detected. And parents will come home and say, you know what, what, what is wrong with my child? Why is they not, you know, and we've had cases like that. So I, you know, I mean, it, Islamic values come from, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion only, is that Islamic foundations can be at home. It can be at the masjid, connecting with your masjid, you know, things like that, Sunday school, stuff like that. Um, and not necessarily putting your child into if they need the additional resources that are available in public schools, then that might be your best route, right? Uh, because, you know, you don't want uh, at 14 and 15 when you realize like it, then it, by then it's a little too late, right? And it's a little harder. Uh, it's a lot harder, actually, by the time they're in their teens to try to get them to understand to fit into society in a way um, that they could have had they gotten um, therapies earlier on or support in school earlier on. Um, I will say, you know, public schools also have their flaws. And yes, we all know, you know, the fears of public schools, but it, I, I strongly believe in, you know, your home is your first base. That's the first place that your child is, you know, that is accustomed to. They know that that's their safe space. I've had some people tell me, you know, that their child comes home at school, they're perfect, but they come home and they're, you know, having tantrums and why? And I said, you know what? Because their house, their home, their family is their safe space. They cannot do this outside um, in front of 20 or 30 other kids. Uh, maybe they're too embarrassed. Maybe, you know, it's a lot of uh, anxiety. Um, so, you know, so it, it, they come home and that's the point is that your home is your safe space and that's the child's safe space. And they see the parents or parent and they want that you know they that I feel like if you're concerned about the Islamic values and that's where it starts right um and then you know I mean at the end of the day you want we all want our children to be able to function in society and make a good life out of themselves that because we're not going to be around for all of it and you know at some point we will you know we all pass so they should be able to be able to sustain in community in their environment in their in their lifespan they should be able to function and be able to you know um as a as a as a community member and be able to live and you know have tools that might make that maybe you know additional resources like um and yeah i'm going to touch on this as well since we're out here um there's uh like living trusts there's there's special needs islamically as well we have you know, um, there's there's wills that you can create, and uh, there's um, like uh, you can start saving money in accounts uh, and have some sort of savings if you have a child that is probably more severe um, on the spectrum or any special needs, and they might need some lifelong support, monetary support. Then start, you know, saving. Talk with your banks about special needs accounts where they have, you know, they're tax free. They they are for your child, so that as they get older and if they need, you know, money or you know support that way, that they'll have it for them. So, like I said, there's plenty a plethora of opportunities to try to set our kids up so that they can succeed in life, and that's the goal every parent has, whether neurotypical or not. Um, and so, having these tools and utilizing these tools now. Um, you know, I mean, we're supposed to Islamically have a will or some sort of, you know, so this is a good opportunity if you have doubts, you know, you can always change it later, but have, you know, a certain amount of money. How would that, it's, it's good thinking to start thinking about, well, how, you know, at some point do, do they all get a lump sum of money or versus should they get money at specific ages or what should certain money be used towards or, you know, who are family members that you can trust if you have a special needs child 
who are family members that you know will understand and you know because it is it's a huge it's a huge um, it's a huge thing I mean being a parent is one thing but being someone else's caregiver a caregiver for you know your finding that right person that is going to have the same level of compassion as you are towards your own child that is key so those are some things that you know are good to think about now um and we often don't we really don't you know i mean wills and all these are very uh morbid topics that nobody wants to talk about but i think it's like, equally important because you know, i mean we have a living trust in in place for both of our kids and uh there's very specific outlines of what um you know how or what things you know things should happen or where or you know who's in charge of what so it's very important and it it's a peace of mind um so that's something that you know you can talk to your banks about there's also um you know one person i can think of he did our will for us uh he's Qureshi law firm he's in he's based out in dallas and he comes here every now and then um and he does you know a, a lecture on islamic law and the importance of having a will and he's been amazing. I mean, he comes out from Dallas and does, you know, I mean, you can schedule it. They, they, there's lots of uh, options with him. They've been wonderful to us and a lot of other parents that I've talked to. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to the community, I think that, you know, we have, you, there's a need to, I know that there's a lot of hesitation as far as like uh, parents wanting a specific lifestyle. Um, and you know thinking that they'll outgrow it but i'd rather have your child be you know in this in the system and yes that that label could always take be taken off at some point if they're no longer being detected if they if they you know if they grow out you know, not necessarily grow out of it but if it's undetected to a point where they don't need an iep anymore then that that label drops from the school and it's always i will put this that it is key to have you know um to have, I'd rather have more services than less, right? And if those services are available to us, then why not use them, right? Um, and the final thing I wanna say is, I personally think, I mean, you, we all needed that support from our parents. We all need that support that, you know, somebody to be on our team and our kids look at us that we are their biggest teammates, right? We are their biggest cheerleaders. And so, yes, that living with that notion, you if your child does have autism or any other special needs and you know be proud they're they are individuals that are not you know it's not a bad thing it's you know and that's the connotation that we have in society is like oh those kids are weird or those kids are different but there's nothing wrong with being different there's nothing wrong with having autism you know it's not a bad thing it's just a different way of thinking but they are allah's blessings one and two you should be proud of the fact that you have a child and you know and 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 not make them feel like they have to hide that somewhere you know like oh sh don't talk about it they have autism it's like you know i i usually jokingly say this to my husband i'm like you know nobody talked about cancer like 20 years ago our colleagues like our ancestors or i mean you know great grandparents or whoever people would die right and left and we never knew why like it's just like Unka and Tagaloga. but we don't know why and so I'm like, it, but that's so silly. It's ridiculous because now you have, you know, 20 something year olds and 30 something year olds that are having health issues, but nobody knows where it's like, oh, it can't be hereditary. I'm like, well, how did that person pass? Well, I don't know. So the point is to bring awareness, not only because, you know, one day if this child gets married, they have a, a possibility that they might also have a, a child that's on the spectrum. And so, you know, or their spouse should know, but that before that conversation even takes place, the child itself, he or she should be proud with what they have. They have, it's like, it's, we talk about skin color now. We talk about, you know, not uh, sexualizing, talking about women and their features, like, you know, oh, she's skinny, she's fat, she's light skin, she's not, like, we're trying to get away from that as a society. So then this should be equally on the books that, you know, my child has autism and we're proud about it. And, you know, she's phenomenal or he's phenomenal as they are and not feel like you have to hide that under, you know, uh, because then your energy is reflects on your child and they feel like they've done something wrong. And that's not what the feeling we you want. You know where that comes from? And this is whole of my purpose of doing this mental health workshops. It's been a year and a half and I really wish a lot more people enjoyed this and heard this because it's that awareness. Where is that guilt or shame is coming? Because the parent is having it. 
because we are making it as a community, right? If we are aware and educated and we don't act like it's different, then nothing is different. Then the parents not feeling and the child's not feeling it. But um, that's where all the awareness, awareness, awareness comes in is us sort of saying, hey, um, I would have loved to have more people attend this and understand because yes, I go to the masjid and I see this kid, why not understand? And that was my whole goal, right? It's really talking about community resources. Spectrum is a big, big um, field. So we just don't know how to kind of, I didn't want to kind of go, but really understanding is what should I do if I went there and I saw a child? One, don't act different. That's the key to us as a community members is don't act different. There's nothing different about this child. And, and if the kid is having a tantrum, you really understand his perspective that this must be anxiety. The kid is anxious. It's just new and everything is different rather than seeing it as aggression and kind of violence. And that's the immediate response, right? When you see somebody kind of being a little loud, people are afraid, but really saying, am I afraid because I'm afraid? I'm thinking versus the kid is just having a tantrum. So I think there's a lot more of that education and I can't appreciate enough that voice you've, you're trying to create in the community. Uh, the rallying you're doing to kind of say, hey, let's understand this more and be aware. Yeah, and even um, the for doing all of that changes, like for us as a Muslim community together to accept, we're not different. If it's not, it's everywhere there. And then I was trying about the bias that we have. Our Muslim communities do not go to early intervention. We're always putting it under the carpet, like, ah, oh, he'll talk, you didn't talk, and so-and-so didn't talk. So we'll just wait versus getting that early intervention going. And then one of the other resources is Goodwill. Goodwill also is kind of doing some good job opportunities. ACC has some really good cool courses because these kids are really bright and special in different ways. They may be good at computer skills and finding that job opportunity or learning those skills. I have a lot of kids in my practice who really have kind of succeeded really well in sort of going to ACC, picking a course. Um, they may not be great at other things, but they're wonderful and amazing on other things. So really finding that strength and saying, okay, how can I harness that uh, strength and you know move forward right and Notre Dame also uh, university has a program for uh, kids with special or adults young adults with special needs um, that they've come out with classes specifically made for them um, which is pretty phenomenal I mean thinking we're you know that they these companies these organizations are taking initiative now um, I know I, I want to say AMC uh, had a special needs uh, movie day um, once a month, the first Saturday, I want to say, of every month. Um, this was pre-COVID, of course, so I don't know. <laughs> um, something worth looking into. Um, and they have the lights on. They have them dim, not completely dark. Kids are free to move around. There's no, you know, you have kids that are making noise. You have kids that are bouncing up and down, kind of in their own element, but also enjoying a movie because they're able to come into a theater. And, you know, it's Toy Story 4, I want to say. I think that's what the movie that last, you know. And the kids had a blast. Like they got to eat their popcorn. They they got that experience that sometimes parents don't have the opportunities to do. Um, and those kids don't have the opportunities because the parents are too scared. You know, like, what if my child does this? Well, that's why they have these, you know, um, the All Abilities Park, shout out, you know, like they have this wonderful park that is made for wheelchair access. That is, you know, I mean, it's a, a great place. There's also, Two amusement parks um, in San Antonio, Morgan's Wonderland. Uh, that and there's the other one I can't remember. It's a water park, and it's designated. It's designed for parents and families with special needs. Um, Morgan herself, the child that the parents created the park for, has a special needs uh, child, and so they made it very friendly. They have a capacity of how many kids that can go into the park on a specific day, so that there's not over stimulation. Um, so there's lots of you know. Um, the the world is coming. I mean, we are, you know, and one of my favorite, I'm not a big uh, social media YouTube follower or anything, but there is a, a couple in UAE um, that started a YouTube channel and then they started going on Facebook. They are Middle Eastern and they have a son who is on the spectrum and they also have just wonderful experiences. They, they were the ones that told us about, um, you know, UAE was one of the first they uh, support, they have World Autism Day. They do a lot for World Autism Day. They also have uh, early boarding for families with special needs. If you fly Emirates, like they, you can tell them they, you get a special ticket and you go after um, like before, like everybody else, like after first class, I wanna say, but you know, before a lot of other people that are, you know, so that you have time to sit down and adjust and get, you know, um, so they give, you know, they, they give emphasis on that. Um, 
And, you know, I mean, there are resources. We as a Muslims have to give emphasis on this, right? Yeah. Whereas us being Muslims comes from if we don't take the whole humanity and walk with exactly. it. Exactly. I mean, we are, and that's what I tell everyone, like we are the, alhamdulillah, we are supposed to be the ones that show, we're supposed to showcase how wonderful our religion is by being the most accepting, the most peaceful, the most, you know, and I feel like, you know, that is where it comes first is we are supposed to be the ones. And I, uh, you know, to have all of these things in place so that other religions look at us and say, hey, like we see you, you know, you guys, it shouldn't be the other way around. But inshallah, I feel like, you know, the more awareness that we have, the more we talk about it, the more we have these events where it's open, you know, um, then, and, and I feel like the less the load, kind of comes off the parents next time you're on a flight or next time you're at the masjid next time you're you know you see a child tantrum i i saw a little girl uh not too long ago uh in walmart and she was on the floor like just having you know i mean full on and i saw some people looking at her like what is wrong with your child and some other people just you know kept moving and hey like and it's those wonderful stories that you know that makes your heart warm that makes you smile that say like you know those shout outs where they're like hey you got this mom or you got this dad like those are what these people need they want your support not your glares not your oh you suck at parenting looks like you know that's what they want so you know, inshallah, the goal is from here on, and I'm hoping, you know, our, our, the dua is that we we go forward with more open hearts and open minds and more acceptance, because that's what autism is about, uh, you know, accepting the whole, uh, not just autism, but every everyone with a, a different ability, because they are not any less than we are. They're still Allah's creation. I mean, I mean. No, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on our platform and I'm hoping we'll get more to rally up for this thing. Exactly. And um, yeah, no, that's good. So I'll, I'll leave your email there that's on the thing. So in case people reach out and have answers about your organization, so that'll be good. Okay, inshallah. Thank you, Noreen. Thanks. All right. Somebody's got a message here. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Sadaf. Thank you, Sadaf, for rallying up for us. <laughs> so I go. All right, well, I can slam.